Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, to the Adam Smith Institute and Eamon Butler and Madison Peary for having me here today. Uh, I'm very proud, and this is actually the first time in my career that I have to do a speech with glasses. So, uh, but I just I just can't keep increasing the fun size the way I've been doing recently. So. Uh, I'm very proud of getting this opportunity, uh, and, and I also like to thank all of you in the audience, obviously, for for uh, deciding to come here and, and spend the evening here. Uh, it'll remain to be seen whether it was a rational decision, but uh, at least you made it, and, and congratulations on that. What I'm going to try to do here is uh, not so much giving the deep philosophical uh, aspects of, of Iran, because. Uh, Certainly, people like Iran are better uh, at that than, than I am, but I will try to give you some ex examples of how we actually deploy her thoughts in, in practical day-to-day -day life, and also uh, a little bit about uh, the more grim part of the, the speech about a, a world that's really on the wrong track and, and where change is desperately needed, and where certainly, certainly Iran is, 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 is the answer or one of the answers to that, that change. So usually I'll start by quoting someone that, that anyone that knows me realizes is uh, far from being my favorite politician. Not that I have many favorite politicians, but uh, this particular one I consider very much a significant part of the problem that we currently experience. Uh, but at least he did us a favor by underlining just exactly how relevant and important a voice Ayn Rand is even today, uh, more than 30 years after her, her death. So let me start by quoting the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama, for the first and last time this year, I promise you. Uh, but he said uh, during the election campaign, Ayn Rand is one of those things that a lot of us, when we're 17 or 18 and feeling misunderstood, we'd pick up. Then, as we get older, we realize that a world in which we're only thinking about ourselves and not thinking about anybody else in which we are considering the entire project of developing ourselves as more important than our relationship to other people and making sure that everybody else has opportunity, that that's a pretty narrow vision. It is not one that I think describes what's best in America. I will get back to who has a greater vision for America and a human life, but uh, I have a confession to make here initially. I actually did not pick up Ayn Rand as a misunderstood or insecure 17-year-old. I wish I had, uh, but unfortunately I was a 38-year-old man when I first read uh, Atlas Rocks. Uh, and to some extent an insecure man, uh, I will admit. Uh, I, I still remember very clearly how my chief economist, uh, the outspoken and very politically incorrect Stein Jakobsen, you may know him from CNBC, but if you get a chance to hear him, you should. He came home from Holland and he threw a paper bag on, on, on my desk, uh, still soaked in, in sun oil, and he said, this book you have to read. And that was Atlas Rocked. Uh, I did, and it was a great experience, uh, as it is for many, when they're first exposed to, uh, to Rand thinking. Now, when I say that, that I was an insecure 38-year-old, uh, there was a slightly different sense to, let's say, the insecurity of a, of a high school kid. By that time, I had my own business. I was married. I had four kids. And I had pretty strong views about society and politics. Incidentally, not much different to what I, what I, the views that I hold today. But I had always an underlying worry uh, and a concern about what was the real foundation and justification of my views. Um, whether it was only my particular circumstances, uh, my ambitions, and my particular career path that had led me to be a lifelong fan of individualism, freedom, and capitalism. Of course, I would never have admitted it at the time, but I, but I did think about that every now and again. This is a question that uh, most political and philosophical writings at best don't answer at all, or at worst answer with a confirmation that uh, yes, uh, it is indeed uh, random and it's only a result of your situation and your environment, uh, which worldview you end up choosing. Now, Ayn Rand's uh, answer to that, is, uh, to that question is fundamentally different. Uh, her answer is that as a rational being, as a man and not an unthinking animal, you have to choose the path of freedom and individualism. Not just because it works better, not just as something a utilitarian uh, observation, but because it's something fundamental in your nature and because it's simply right. 
it is a necessity for you to fulfill all that you can be as an individual, and it's a necessity for your survival. The use of your mind and the observance of reality and influence on that reality by your own mental capacity, all of that cannot really lead to any other logically correct conclusion or result. So in other words, Ayn Rand, uh, certainly for me, remove the, removes the insecurity about whether your choices were right or whether they were just uh, random and, and fickle uh, and caused by, your, by the circumstances that you find yourself in. She provides something unusual uh, in the political debate, uh, a philosophical foundation for what most commentators only present as a utilitarian uh, argument that individualism and capitalism simply works better than collectivism and socialism. Very few advance the moral argument, but that is ultimately the real argument and the argument that, if anything, is going to win this battle in the long run. That distinction is, is, is very important and it has profound consequences. And it begins to reach out for an explanation of what has been called the, the, the great disconnect. Why is it that in spite of socialism failing so completely again and again, why is it that in spite of capitalism and freedom clearly improving people's lives and creating wealth uh, wherever it's applied, <laughs> Why is it that even with that knowledge and experience uh, that we have to fight new attacks on freedom year after year, decade after decade? Those attacks come in many different disguises, uh, but always with a moral root that capitalism is evil, it's destructive, it's egoistic, it's anti-nature. Where we ourselves, on the other hand, we fail to advance a moral argument. Uh, we fail to, to explain uh, why we think that, that our view is, is a morally right view, while the opponents of capitalism always sell their fairly uh, past the sell by date rotten philosophical goods. They always sell that by claiming a higher moral ground, uh, altruism and the need for control of human freedom to protect man against himself by handing over responsibility to collectivists and anti-individualist anti leaders who know so much better than the rest of us. And if you claim enough moral ground, there is no need for any clear explanation of uh, why or how exactly they would know better. And there is no questioning of why the leadership should necessarily fall to them. This is a very old problem and, and it has reoccurred in, in many different ways throughout the centuries. And right now we, we're seeing a solid revival, a significant pushback against the advances that were made for freedom when the Iron Curtain came down and the despotic leaders of, of the Soviet Union and the satellite states were overturned. At that time, I think some of us foolishly thought that this was the final victory of capitalism and freedom and that surely now the world would quickly move in a better direction while the few remaining dictatorships around the world would collapse one by one before, before too long. Now it hasn't worked out that way, we can conclude. And in fact, maybe the disappearance of, uh, of that very obvious enemy uh, and that very obvious failure that was the Soviet Union has had the opposite effect. Without a strong example, a really convincing example of how inferior socialism really is, many people now begin again to believe that socialism could be a solution to the problems in the West. And if just capitalism could be reined in, uh, we will all experience a better and more fair society. Obviously, there are multiple fallacies in that view. First of all, free capitalism has never really been experienced by very many people alive today. The strange hybrid of Western societies today allows only limited capitalism, only enough to create uh, enough wealth to support a wider range of social and political ambitions, ambitions that are largely controlled by, by anti-capitalists. Secondly, of course, we know by now, indisputably, that socialism doesn't work. Full-blown socialism doesn't work at all, and lesser degrees of socialism restricts to a higher or lower level the creation of growth and prosperity. And thirdly, socialism is not in any way fair. 
equality in outcome can never be claimed to be fair. Equality in opportunity is indeed fair, but if the outcome is then collectivized and shared irrespective of effort and dedication, fairness completely ceases to exist. To hear a US president saying that it's wrong to consider the entire project of developing ourselves as more important than a set of social obligations is, is rather disturbing, I think. And it goes to show that the malady that has long beset Europe is spreading very rapidly to the US. Now, before turning to the particular relevancy of, of Ayn Rand in the current economic uh, and political debate, I'd like to talk just a little about her relevance, not just for individuals, but also the benefits for multiple forms of cooperation with other individuals that we may choose by our own free will. More specifically, we realized in our business that her ideas holds plenty of relevance and opportunity for commercial organizations. So I'm going to speak a little bit about that. I am the, the co-founder and the co-CEO of, of Saxo Bank. It's an international investment and trading bank with offices in around 25 countries. We are headquartered in a socialistic country called Denmark. Uh, with that kind of, of base and more than, than 50 different nationalities among our employees, with clients from all over the world, my partner Kim Fonet and I uh, early on felt that it was necessary to specify a clear set of principles and values to ensure that our business developed in a sustainable and coherent manner. A way in which we could benefit from the diversity of uh, our employees and clients, but without the many differences leading to confusion and chaos in the organization. When you're from many different cultures uh, and spread over many different locations, uh, it's valuable to operate from a set of agreed principles. In fact, uh, I'm sure that almost all successful organizations do that intuitively, but I also believe it's very good to be explicit about exactly what those values and principles are. The good thing is that capitalism brings people by their own choice together around joint goals that make sense for everyone and that benefits the employer, the employee, and the client alike. And as a result, in a commercial organization, finding common ground is much easier than if we were a political organization or cultural or religious forum. In fact, we have, I believe, representatives of every major religion, culture, nation, and race among our employers. And although we face issues from time to time, like any other organization, they never really stem from, from those differences. It is a given that in a meritocratic organizations, it will always be the results, the ethic behavior, and the productive efforts that uh, count over and above anything else. In our first pre-RAND corporate statement from the last 90s, pre-RAND in our sense, uh, we still stated things like that explicitly, that uh, there was equal opportunity irrespective of your background, your religion, your sexual orientation, and all this uh, stuff that, uh, that people feel the need to put into to those kind of statements. But today, we made a second post-RAND version where it's all about the values and all about the interaction that we can expect from each other in the organization that we set out to, to describe. And after having read Ayn Rand's uh, works and becoming familiar in particular with her seven virtues, Kim and I were, were not in doubt that in effect uh, what was meant as, guiding to a, as guidance to a living, uh, to a successful, prosperous and productive life for an individual could equally well serve as values for, for what an organization can build upon. Several years later, I was uh, very pleased to uh, to discover that at least one other bank uh, had made exactly the same decision. Uh, BB&T Bank in the US, uh, led by the formidable RAND supporter John Allison, who incidentally gave this very speech uh, last year, had been successfully applying the seven virtues uh, well before we even heard of them, and has built a great business on this foundation. It's interesting that uh, BB&T Bank was just about the only major American bank to come out of the financial crash uh, unharmed. Now, I would like to, to run through the seven virtues and, and describe how we ask our employees to consider and understand them in a business context. 
Some of you will know about these uh, seven virtues or values, as we've chosen to call them in the Saxon Bank context. But this was a non-exhaustive list of important virtues and values that uh, Ayn Rand defined over a very long period of time to describe what was necessary for a successful life. Rationality, independence, integrity, honesty, justice, productivity, and pride. We chose to make these uh, our own values uh, because if somebody's already done a brilliant job and, and it works, why, why try to improve on it? And in this case, we were very convinced that, that this was exactly what was, what was needed. When we introduce these values to our employers, we, we do it something roughly like this. You're not necessarily guaranteed a successful career or a great life. Uh, accidents or illness or other random elements may interfere. So you're not necessarily guaranteed a successful career uh, by applying these values to your work. But it's very difficult to imagine that anyone that uh, systematically disregards or violate these values would in fact uh, be able to live successfully. Just try the experiment with each of the values. If you're continuously dishonest so that no one trusted you in the end, could you succeed with this for a lifetime? Or what if you totally disregarded justice so you never encouraged what was good around you and made no difference between valuable and worthless activities, making no distinction between productive and destructive actions. No decent human being would want to associate themselves with you if they felt that you'd made no distinction between good and evil, between right and wrong. And so it goes for all of these values that if you, if you try to think about the opposite, if you didn't do it, uh, you'll find that they're all necessary ingredients in a good life. And in our case, for Saxo Bank, essential in building a strong, reliable, and competitive business. As I said, uh, we didn't define, uh, invent these values, uh, but when we read, uh, we read Atlas Rock the first time, we understood exactly that uh, there is an underlying philosophical context and justification for what we actually believe to be just common sense. What is so great about this particular novel is that it gives you a more detailed philosophical foundation for what you intuitively know is right in the first place. It tells you what creates results and why other contradictory sets of values are unlikely to create long-term success. So we go on to, to uh, give ideas for practical application of the values in, in everyday work. About rationality, we try to explain that behaving in a rational fashion seems like the obvious thing to do. But actually in many organizations, uh, including many private organizations, a lot of time is spent on very rational and unproductive activity. Rationality means applying a logical approach to identifying how to arrive at a desired end or to gain a desired value in the most efficient and straight line manner. It also means taking into account the relevant information required to, to reach decisions and to decide on the optimum path. As an example, if a competitor has created a better product than your own, you cannot just talk it into oblivion. Even if in the short term you might be able to convince a client that uh, he should accept an inferior solution, long term you're always at risk of this client becoming more informed and ultimately you'll lose if that's your if that is your answer to somebody doing better than yourself. The only way to deal when we are faced with, with competitive products is to investigate them thoroughly, take an active interest in, in the industry developments, and meet any challenges head on by improving our own services and improving the features of our products. We cannot dream or wish or hope or lie ourselves uh, out of a difficult to fulfill but, but reality-based client demand. If the client gets a better service or better product somewhere else, we need to deal with this reality and we need to improve in order to maintain the relationship. If you have a disagreement with another employee, you need to deal with that head on as well. If you're right, of course you should stand up for your point of view, but if you turn out to be wrong, you should acknowledge it and move forward. You should not pursue any line of action in our business for any other reason than it being the most rational and logical way to move forward, even if it means giving up your own inferior idea, or if it means the justified recognition of one of your colleagues instead of yourself. 
Making the right rational choices is what life is all about, life and business. And just as irrationality leads to failure, or at very least uh, leads to dependency on other people's rationality, well then, rationality applied will normally lead to success and independence. In fact, it almost always does if it's consistently applied and carefully and intelligently executed. We tell them about independence, that all of the virtues are really derivatives of rationality, and this particular one means using rational thinking in an independent manner. In spite of all types of teamwork, all types of organizations, all forms of society, it simply boils down to one brain per individual. There is no such thing as group thinking. You shouldn't confuse that with individual thinkers choosing to work together in a group which can be extremely productive. There is no such thing as a collective brain. So whether you like it or not, everybody has their own individual mind that you can choose to use or, or, or not to use. Your mind is a primary tool of survival, but it's also the gateway to much more than survival. To a large extent, the more and the better you use your mind, which implicitly means using it independently, the more successful, and at least if applied to commercial business, the more comfortable a living you'll be able to create for yourself and whoever you choose to share your life with, and the more personal fulfillment and the more self-esteem you will experience. Now, independence does not mean reinventing the wheel or not accepting the law of gravity or Einstein's scientific theories because before you checked all the facts and calculations yourself. It does not mean a lack of respect for where you work, assuming that that work is freely chosen by yourself, or lack of respect for the managers or leaders that you interact with as a result of that decision. Or nor does it mean that you have to define every single process personally before implementing it. Independence does not mean that you should not learn from anyone else, but it does mean that blindly copying or repeating anything and everything you see and hear uncritically will not get you anywhere in the long run. If you unquestionably accept anything that sounds good without further considerations of its consequences, or any idea that simply seems to be agreed upon by other people, even if they're a majority, or perhaps particularly if they're a majority, you can be fairly sure that, that, uh, that this will not create great success in your life. We tell people about integrity, and integrity in our understanding is standing up for what you mean and be prepared to execute your ideas and defend your values. So in integrity is therefore closely related to the value of independence. Integrity is about do, doing what you say you will do, honoring your commitments and fulfilling your promises. Integrity is accepting that there's a relation between the dreams you have for your future and the work you need to put in every day to reach those goals, because otherwise your life will just be an endless frustration and disappointment. In a commercial organization such as ours, extending that integrity to our clients and partners is, of course, uh, critical. We need to manage expectations correctly uh, so that we invariably deliver at least what we promise. Conversely, we, we need to be very careful to explain to clients exactly what our services are and what the risks and opportunities uh, are that they will face working with us. And there is no real substitute for an integrated view of life. If you're not basing your life and your dreams and your ambitions on, on reality, either you will fail completely or you will be entirely dependent on somebody else to support you because they act rationally on your behalf. But that, in effect, is a parasitic and, and unsatisfactory existence at best and I think a highly risky proposition for the long term. We tell our, our employers about honesty. And I think honesty needs to be understood in both the normal sense, i.e. you should not lie unnecessarily to other people. As Rand describes, there can be occasions where actually it's justified to lie if your life is at stake, etc. But honesty is also the concept of intellectual honesty. Being honest means meeting reality head on and trying not to fool yourself and others. By not in an objective manner, trying to interpret and deal with the facts you're faced with. Being dishonest can take many different forms, such as lying to clients, colleagues, or friends. Clearly, this can never work in the long run, as the truth inevitably becomes clear sooner or later. 
and future relationships would be greatly damaged by, by, that, uh, by that disclosure. Dishonesty could also be pretending to be something that you're not. For example, would getting a particular job inside or outside the organization because you, because you lied about your abilities, would it not be more disastrous to get that job than to not get it? Because you'll ultimately end up failing, losing credibility, and in the meantime, you probably missed the chance to make progress at something where you could have been great and excelled instead. If you're attracting a spouse or a circle of friends by pretending to be a different character than you really are, forcing yourself to live a life that is not what you really wanted, presenting a facade that you need to think about every minute of the day because it's not honest to your nature, and probably again eventually getting cold on your bluff after all those efforts. So being honest is a selfish value, as are all sustainable values. Honesty is for your own benefit, not just a duty that you owe to other people. And that, in fact, goes for all of Rand's values, that they serve the purpose of making your life more successful and your philosophy more coherent. The really great thing about, uh, about applying the values is that they also have beneficial implications for your surroundings, for your friends, for your colleagues, for the bank, in our case, for society, which are all components that come together to help make your life successful. So there is a win-win in honesty just in the rest of the values and the contents of, uh, of, of our corporate statement, which is exactly what we, what we want to portray to our employees. About justice, actually I have to say one thing here because uh, there are seven values. Maybe right now you're hoping there will only be four. We, we sponsor a, a big cycling team, the Team Saxo Bank, incidentally Team Saxo Tinker, and uh, they also run with values. And, uh, and my very good friend that runs and owns that team, Bjarne Ries, that won the Tour de France in 1996, he's heavy on, on his four values. Uh, and I uh, can remember speaking to one of the top writers that, said, oh, you know, we've never, we've never been to a team where people speak about values like this, and Bjarne is going on about these four values. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. We actually have seven in our bank. He said, no, 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 don't tell Bjarne. <laughs> so so uh, we're, we're getting there. But I want, I want to just... Uh, take the last three values as well. What we tell our employers about justice, well, justice in our terms is essentially the meaning that you should not just sit back and accept everything around you without having a view on it. You should not be afraid to speak up when somebody does something wrong or behaves in an unacceptable manner. By keeping quiet, you're not doing your, your co-worker or colleague a favor because that person may not be aware that what they're doing is wrong or questionable. Or, at worst, if he or she is, they may think that doing the wrong thing will never have any negative consequences for themselves, hence encouraging them to continue that way. Along the same line of thinking, you should also give praise when someone does something positive, not just to be nice, but to encourage such uh, actions in the longer term, to show that you notice and to show that it makes a difference to you. In terms of our business, uh, this is closely related to the value of honesty uh, and essentially means that you should neither hold back constructive and justified criticism, nor should you fail to praise a colleague that does something of value or ethically correct when you see it. Where we are doing really unbearable damage is uh, when we fail to recognize appropriately those people who do great things. Whether this is out of envy or indifference or lack of observance, it's very damaging if people that should be praised fail to get the recognition they deserve. Being just is both the right action towards your colleagues and it's also a way to increase again your own chances of long-term success by correcting mistakes and encouraging good work. About the value of productivity, uh, we tell our employees that uh, being productive means creating products, creating systems, creating services that are valued sufficiently by our clients to enable us to run a successful business and for all of us to experience the joy of success and, and something as simple as being paid a salary that allows us to care adequately for our families and for ourselves. Being productive means uh, taking pride in providing for your own life and avoiding relying unnecessarily on other people's production. Recognize that in any other way of living, uh, of living whether whether that's stealing or begging or voting for politicians that give you money by taking it away from other members of society, that may work for you in the short term, 
but it would be completely unsustainable unless somebody else somewhere made the decision to produce. The world would discontinue in 72 hours if nobody made the decision to produce. I think all of us know the joy of a job well done, to achieve success, to use your mind creatively and productively to see things grow and to see them expand through your own efforts is a really great experience and life would be much poorer if we did not experience this individually and together with our colleagues every day of the working week. Enjoying the fruits of work, getting the things you want, having fun and free time on your hands, enjoying hard-earned time with your family is all great, but getting there, securing this through your own efforts is a big part of the whole experience and the whole exercise. So productivity in our business plays a big part in all we do. It's important that we always bear in mind productivity in our lives as a necessary and logical objective. It's great for us to spend time on research and thinking ahead and having great plans and long discussions if and where necessary, lots of PowerPoints. But at the end of the line, the goal has to be productivity. The goal has to be a dollar. Any initiative we undertake in our business at least must have productivity as its key objective because if we allow ourselves to lose sight of productivity, eventually the business will fail and we will all lose out in life. This only goes for private businesses, incidentally. The last uh, is more again a derivative of having applied the, the six initial uh, virtues or values uh, the correct way, but that's about pride and that's a really tough one in, uh, in my home country in Denmark. Most people, and certainly most Danes, have been brought up with the notion that uh, pride is a bad thing and people should rather be humble than proud. We have something called the law of Yente, that is a particular Danish version of the tall, the tall puppy syndrome, deriving from a, a famous novel, uh, which very strongly criticizes the success of individuals and portray any achievement as unworthy, wrong, or inappropriate. This is a very strong character trait, uh, unfortunately, in, in my country. But in our business, we believe that uh, people are indeed responsible for their own character, their own achievements, and their own results. And it does matter that you try to do well. Even in the fundamental choice, deciding to be a productive individual, take charge of your own destiny, take responsibility for your life instead of relying on other people for your sustenance, just by making that decision, you have reason to be proud because it's not a given in this world anymore. By having decided to work for a living instead of stealing or begging your way through life, you have already established a critical foundation for justifiable pride. And the reward for leading such, such a life are the values, both physical and mentally, that you can create, allowing your, yourself to have self-esteem and be proud of your, your life. I hope this gave you an idea about how we practically try to deploy Iron Range ideas in, in a modern business. And the really great experience is that people actually embrace this message. They, they really want clear values in their life and in the business they work for. And we've seen a lot of interest in, in these sorts since we introduced them more formally through our corporate statement. Most Saxon Bank employers have read Atlas Rocks, and most of them are, are good capitalists. I don't think you'll be very happy as a socialist in Saxo Bank. I certainly hope not. That's not, what we're trying to, <laughs> that's not what we're trying to achieve. We have several sessions every year where new employers can learn about these values and principles or old employers can uh, refresh in their knowledge. Actually, Yaron has several occasions been over there helping us uh, uh, give a very clear picture of, of what these values are. So after this practical example, the example I know best, uh, I would like to turn to the broader relevance of Ayn Rand in society today. I think first and foremost, uh, Ayn Rand remains, remains the, the, one of the very few people that recognize with crystal clarity that we will not win the battle through just proving that freedom and capitalism works. It's already been proven beyond discussion. Nevertheless, we're still facing attacks on freedom every day. One of the biggest mistakes we can make is to assume that rationality will prevail, that just through superior economic performance, freedom will capture enough people's hearts in a democracy to win the day. This creates a major problem for those of us that like to argue rationally rather than emotionally. 
At the same time, unfortunately, it creates a major opportunity for politicians that intuitively know that in a rational world, there would be very limited demand for their services. <laughs> Only in an irrational, emotional universe where opportunists can gain access to the media, can get lots of visibility to express feelings and try again to take their moral high ground, no matter how unfounded it is in, in reality. Only in such an environment can you survive without having to produce a practical, productive result and instead prosper and benefit from empty talk and uh, third-rate acting performances. This tendency, unfortunately, has only gotten stronger during the recent crisis. There's often a complete disconnect between reality and the words used to describe it, the actions pretending to deal with it. In particular, this is very noticeable in, in the Eurozone these days. Secondly, Ayn Rand has gained renewed relevance and attention because her prediction have become fulfilled in many different areas. This, of course, pleases and reconfirms long-standing admirers like myself, but also, well, it doesn't please us. It would be nice if she hadn't been right on all these things, but, but certainly reconfirms us. But it also brings in many new supporters to the scene looking for answers to the crisis. And I think to name but a few predictions, clearly the dynamics of democracy and interfering politicians that are very well described in, in Atlas Rock, where constant intrusive corrective attempts to fix a given problem invariably leads to new unforeseen problems that need additional correction, triggering an endless series of correcting moves uh, where only two things are certain. First, politician will assign ever greater power to themselves during this process as they, have man they manage to convince the citizens that uh, there's need for even more interference, although the problems were created by interference in the first place. Endless examples of this, both in the US and in the Eurozone. The EU's standard answer to any of their own fa failure is that if they had just had even greater powers, uh, everything would have been okay. And the real question here is not to ask how or why they claim this. What else could they really do if, if the only alternative is to admit incompetence and failure? The real question is how do voters continuously manage to, to ignore the reality and uh, believe in their politicians rather than themselves? The other thing you can be sure of in that process is that by every move, by every correcting intrusion, freedom and capitalism, which is the only real answer to the current crisis, gets ever more restricted and prevented from working efficiently, meaning that the underlying strength of, of human ingenuity and creativity is stopped from working appropriately and becomes increasingly powerless to pull us out of the deep troubles that we're in. Another of Rand's predictions of business people using government favors in return for giving up their independence has sadly been more confirmed in my industry than anywhere else. It's embarrassing to see the extent that the banking industry has relied on support from governments uh, and how ruthlessly they are currently exploiting the office of cheap money available from central banks. Very little of these bailouts filter down to the real economy. But at the same time, the banks are now on the firing line all over the world, helpless to resist an endless row of inquiries, of fines, of regulatory tightening, excessive compliant costs that are pushed onto their profit and loss sheet, hurting earnings, making them even more dependent on the state for support. It's a vicious circle for an industry if I ever saw one. And I feel that we are approaching the end of banking as a private industry. But once we have a government-controlled banking industry, our problems will, will really begin. Pick a winner, corporate social responsibility, employment rules, affirmative action, creation of fictional jobs, plain political popularity and obedience will then be what's, uh, what's ruling who prospers and survives in all industries, uh, not just banking. Beware that development, it's poison to capitalism and growth and to the prosperity of every person in this room. The new central bank regulator, uh, the banking union, ultimately draining the sound banks for money to support the failing ones, could be the nail in the coffin coming from the EU to a bank near you soon. In fact, I think the undemocratic, power-grabbing, emotional, populistic Washington that takes over an Atlas Rocked is today most closely resembled by the EU and the Eurozone in the real world. Not that DC is far behind. Uh, it's quite frightening how much of the rhetoric in Brussels 
and some of the Eurozone countries, frightening how it resembles Iron Range universe. We listen to constant talk of solidarity, of progress under difficult circumstances, the need for more central power, it's taken directly out of Atlas Rock. There's no connection with the reality where we're losing an entire generation on the floor. There's no connection with 62% youth unemployment in Greece or more than 50 in Spain. There's no connection to this reality and the talk that we hear from Brussels. And there's no humility whatsoever in the, in the face of this near total failure that these people represent. There's no wish to give the public uh, a say in any of the major new initiatives and you see blunt inter intervention directly in, in national governments. The EU is failing big time, and still its only response is to gather more power in the hands of Brussels, clearly against the will of the populations of Europe, that are beginning to see that in fact the Euro may be the, the practical equivalent of Project X for, for people that know Atlas Rock. In France, we now have a president who by his own admission hates the rich, so much so that he's trying to circumvent his own constitution uh, to introduce punitive taxes on the rich, although it's illegal, and so much so that he drives relentlessly forward with proposals for a financial transaction tax that has been shut down by pretty much every historical experience and that most economists view as a massive own goal damaging the countries that deploy it. But it does seem that the rich also hate their president judging by the number of them leaving, famously spearheaded by Gérard Depardieu, for places like Belgium, that amazingly actually acts as a tax haven for the rich French in spite of all the EU rhetoric, or Switzerland, where inflows of new immigration requests, according to my sources, are at absolute record highs, particularly from Scandinavia, from the UK, and from France. Now, Depardieu himself, of course, chose Russia, which speaks volumes, I think, of what deep trouble Western Europe is really in. However, this development does lead to, to, I think, a very interesting question, and a question that is full of hope. Is there indeed also a solution to the problem, such as the one Ayn Rand foresaw with the flight to uh, Gold's Gulch in, in, in Atlas Rock? A place where, where people can actually interact rationally without, uh, without too much interference, or without any interference from the outside world. Well, it will certainly be difficult to find a place entirely outside of the reach of aggressive governments eager for tax dollars as Switzerland has learned to its misfortune. But is there a possibility to create an area so attractive and so successful that it would attract enough good and productive people to become a good example for other nations to follow? Unfortunately, not much points in that direction as most countries pursuing such strategies lack sorely in that other commodity, personal freedom uh, and security from governmental abuse. And in the very few places that try to provide both, such as Switzerland's uh, but even Switzerland seems to also be attracting the Malays. I live in Switzerland. I chose it as my country of residence a few years back, and, and I haven't regretted it for a second. But then again, it depends what benchmark you compare it to. Um, but even in Switzerland, where with its effective tax competition between cantons, with a very direct democracy, it has many features aimed at keeping the state under control. But I think in, in the last couple of years, you, you see quite disturbing attempts at reducing this tax competition, introducing death taxes, and latest, the infamous 12 to 1 proposal, I don't know if you heard about that, but uh, the 12 to 1 proposal that seeks to limit executive pay to maximum 12 times the lowest paid employees. Now this is Switzerland, mind you. While that particular measure is not likely to pass, uh, I, I still know of several big companies preparing contingency plans for spinning off management teams into separate units, uh, and even more sadly, laying off their lowest paid workers to instead use temps and in source services. I mean, talk about an own goal for both the strong and the weak. You know, the strong wasting all their time on this instead of focusing business and creating jobs, and the low paid actually being laid off because of, of a rule like that. So Switzerland's not safe. <coughs> Nowhere seems to be fully safe from populism and, and irrationality any longer. It's very difficult to, to see the necessary reforms forthcoming. And sadly, we may have to go through a much more severe economic collapse before change will be, will be forced upon us. Unfortunately, that change might as well turn out to be totalitarian in nature. In fact, uh, it seems the more likely outcome uh, in the short run. 
So I'm not very hopeful for, for change in the more uh, excessively developed welfare states and, and not really anywhere else either. I'll give you a very quick example from my own country, Denmark. Denmark has the total highest tax pressure in the world, far above European average. Uh, has the smallest private sector in Europe to support one of the biggest, if not the biggest, public sector. Very generous entitlement system, allowing unemployed and unemployable citizens an income well above that achieved by full-time employers in, in the private sector in many, even Western European countries. When you see that, you'll, you'll know that there's a big need for, for tax revenues. Actually, the majority of Danish politicians, they intuitively understand that, uh, regrettably, in most of their views, that, but they do understand that capitalists are an, an unpleasant necessity to generate the necessary revenues to fund everything under the sun. What, uh, what that leads to uh, is, uh, is a, sad, uh, a sad situation where there's an immense focus and immense uh, supervision over any kind of business activity to make absolutely sure that you don't miss a single dollar from somewhere. So being a capitalist in a social welfare state means extreme supervision, general skepticism, mistrust from your fellow citizens, and a very unpleasant feeling that uh, most politicians are looking for that exact point of pain where maximum tax can be extracted, uh, not to avoid harming business and growth, but to avoid pushing you so hard that you choose to leave the country, close down your activities, and transfer the jobs, the jobs abroad. Danish parliament's nearly devoid of people with practical business experience, or even any kind of experience from, from the private sector. Uh, we got a new government in 2011, a socialist government, and uh, many central, centrally important ministers never held a job outside political parties and organizations. The, the government is supported. It's, we have, you know, you're getting used to coalition governments. We always have them. We have eight parties. Uh, so there's always a coalition, but the, the basic parliamentary foundation is a de facto communist party. The Prime Minister brought in a 27-year-old to be the Minister for Taxation from the Socialist People's Party. Uh, this is a very important post in Denmark, Ministry of Taxation. This guy didn't get elected even to Parliament, so he must have been pulled in for some particularly strong skills that he had managed to achieve as a 27-year-old working for, for political organizations. And we had a 28-year-old uh, MP as Minister for Health and Prevention, also from the Socialist People's Party who incidentally started her new job by going on maternity leave immediately after being appointed. <laughs> Other interesting choices included the former leader of the now defunct official Communist Party in Denmark, uh, went on the <clears throat> some years after the war came down. But uh, this former leader uh, was selected for Minister of Business and Growth. In fairness, he has since been replaced by a school teacher. So how did they get elected? Well, clearly, Danish voters don't value business or business experience very highly. This is very understandable because uh, uh, more than half of the adult population is either working in the public sector or living on some form of social transfer payment. Uh, much higher proportion, incidentally, than very comparable countries like Sweden or Norway or Finland. Out of a population of 5.6 million, approximately 1 million under 15 years of age, they're excused. A little more than 2 million out of these 5.6 million are pensioners, unemployed, sick, on social transfer payments for other reasons. Around 800 and change are employed in the public sector, mind you, still 5.6 million people. This leaves around 1.8 million Danes that are not directly dependent on, on, on the state payments in some shape or form. But even among this group, there's a very high focus on cheap subsidized child care, free health care, child bonus payments, subsidized housing, because they pay so much in tax that they're trying to collect in every which way they can, a very, very vicious uh, circle. At the other extreme, only 28,000 Danes have an annual income in excess of 1 million Danish kroner, which is 120,000 pounds approximately. So not surprisingly, a politician that likes to get re-elected will be more likely to cater to 2.6 million voters depending on the state for their livelihood than to the 28,000 hardworking individuals making a, a, a decent annual income. Um, therefore, attempts to highlight the risk of a brain drain, by, a brain drain by taxing such incomes very aggressively 
is uh, generally dismissed as, uh, as a scare tactic, and it's generally accepted from most politicians that there are no such things as dynamic effects from tax policies, meaning that any su suggestion to lower taxes in order to promote growth must, in order to be taken seriously, be fully financed by a tax raise uh, in some other part of the economy. Uh, of course, it would be beneficial if, if full financing meant that you would sometimes consider reducing public sector expenditure, but unfortunately, it normally leads to a continuously moving up and down of different tax rates to compensate lost revenues on one tax with revenues from other taxes. Many of these very ill thought out. So I think we can safely assume that, that uh, no serious reforms uh, are, uh, will be undertaken in that type of environment. Of course, some citizens begin to sense that the current system is not completely sustainable. It is at least threatened, mostly by external causes. People don't really like to look at the more obvious internal causes. So a lot of time and political posturing is revolving around pretending to be involved in deep and, and, and difficult negotiations about wide-reaching reforms and decisions. But the reality is that this is fundamentally an illusion intended to create a feeling of dealing with the issues that the country faces and reassuring voters that the current system can be upheld without any serious cutback, sacrifices or changes. So clearly this will not lead to, to any time soon major changes in, in, in that type of, of society. As I said earlier, this battle will not be won by economic rationality. If it doesn't happen a long time before, for sure it's out the door once more than 51% of the voters left from the government. What we need to do is we need to change the values, we need to change the morality, we need to enlighten on the misunderstandings, and we need to undermine the deliberate lies that our politicians feed to the electorate about what constitutes solidarity and justice and common good. Is it solidarity to make people into losers and victims and leave them totally unable to care for themselves? Is it justice to regulate every aspect of a normal person's life and continuously monitor his every move? Is it the common good to stop business investors from creating wealth and prosperity? This change, if it ever is going to happen, has to change, has to start by changing the values. Focus on the young people, as I know you do here in the Adam Smith Institute, and I, I applaud you on that. Uh, but starting with the young, they will get a terrible deal in the future. Just look at the numbers, right? Focus on the many small entrepreneurs, the SMEs, uh, that actually create 80% of all new jobs in Europe today, but in return get nothing but, but paperwork and bureaucracy. Focus on the micro rather than the macro elements in the economy. That's the only way to, to, to long-term uh, secure change here. And when the message is about values and fundamental change, no one is more powerful than Ayn Rand. Uh, her books constitute inspirational, understandable, practically applied philosophy. Saxo Bank has given out more than 15,000 books today, I think, uh, in the past 10 years. And I hope, uh, I hope some of you here in the audience today will also help spread her work among, among the people for whom they're relevant, the receptive people, the young, the entrepreneurs, the new political movements that are protesting the EU's excesses, uh, movements that are against uh, the increasing lack of respect for the individual. Because if we don't succeed in changing the values and we change at least the, the values and the direction of the next generation, I must say I fear that the full prediction of, of Atlas Rock will become reality. And while the last two pages uh, may hold some promise for, for the far and distant future, I think the, the 1100 coming up to that is not something that, that people of my age group will, will really like to go through if we can avoid it. I used to say to people uh, when I started talking about this that we were at page three to 400 in this substantial book. I think we're now at page seven to 800, and I certainly don't want to see pages 9, 10, uh, 9, 1,000, and 1,100, because uh, that's where it begins to get really ugly. But it has to start with changing the values. Rational explanation of that capitalism works better is just not enough. It's proven too many times. Values will do the trick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
got, uh, looking at my Danish watch, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. So who would like to? All right, let's start at the back. We've got a roving microphone. Hi, uh, I'm James Sons. I work for KPMG. Uh, I was just wondering, if we were to leave the EU, would that not be bad for international trade and bad for international businesses like Saxo Bank and KPMG? And uh, there's another one. Carl Hudson, I work for African Peace Program. Um, I was, I listened to you talk about how we live in limited capitalism in the West. Um, but it seems to me that you talked a bit about this, how some, most companies actually live under, make their employees work under full socialism in kind of a, a very kind of quote unquote egalitarian for the best word. I was wondering why it is you think that most companies um, are not more liberal or capitalistic on the inside. Um, when clearly people are happy to be partially capitalist on the outside. Okay, to, to the first one on the EU, uh, personally, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical, of, extremely skeptical, I'd say, of where the EU has been heading for the past uh, 20 years or more. Well, in fact, since we joined in '72, because we never got what we, uh, uh, what we, what we are, what we expected, or what we were promised. But I don't actually advocate necessarily leaving the EU. I, I advocate that we get back to what the EU is, which is a, which is a free trade area, which is a, an area that removes uh, trade uh, barriers and restrictions, which makes it easier for people to to uh, to uh, cooperate and, and trade with each other. Right? I, I think uh, I think the real monstrous mistake that has been made is 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 the euro. Uh, I've been against it since since the outset, but. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, in recent years it's become very, very evident that all the, all the, all the negative uh, predictions you, you might have about it has come true and, and even come true worse than, than, than you had feared. Uh, but I think the, the Eurozone and the other 10 Euro, uh, EU countries are, are slightly different. You know, I made a book recently, uh, or to be more correct, uh, Czech President Václav Klaus wrote a book that also here came out in England. Uh, called uh, Europe Shattered Illusions. Uh, I published the same book in Denmark and wrote there a, a, a lengthy afterword about uh, what I saw as uh, the, the way forward for, for the 10 countries outside. And I actually think that the 10 countries outside of the Eurozone should, should try to leave the Eurozone to, to sort of sort out their own issues for the time being and try to get around an alternative to the EU in as much as possible. Try to create what, what is the idea of the EU uh, Around for the the free trade uh, the free trade idea, I think that ten countries together are, are so important a part of the European economy that they could they could actually stand quite strong against uh, against the eurozone. But if it's just individual countries uh, trying to fight against the inevitable power grab from Brussels, it gets very complicated. But I think if you could if you could gather a more traditionalist. Uh, common market approach uh, among the 10 other countries and maybe even open up to, to some other countries of, of relevance for that, uh, for, that, uh, for that trade area, I think we could, we could a little bit like, like looking for, for the goals, that we could create perhaps an example. That obviously, it would very quickly outcompete the Eurozone, so, so I'm not necessarily advocating that you, you should leave unless every other option is exhausted. I don't actually think it would be a problem for the UK to leave if they really had to, the UK uh, is by far too important a trade partner to, uh, to, to be blackmailed in that context, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. But, but I think it would be a lot better if, if the 10 countries that are not in the midst of this mess uh, that, that the Eurozone country have created, they got together and tried to work on a, on a better model uh, a little bit uh, along the lines, I think very meekly, but uh, suggested by, by Cameron some, some while back. Uh, but it has to be... I think more forceful than, than that particular proposal. Uh, the other one, uh, you meant inside companies, not countries. You, you didn't mean inside the companies per se, yeah? yeah. Well, uh, then, 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 then they display to the public or, or that the surrounding society, or? Well, I, I don't think you can run it. You cannot really run a company successfully if you're not deploy. Some, some relatively simple rules that are quite different to, uh, to the way that society around us are being run. You have leaders, you have people setting out a course, you have people 
you listen to people, but you, uh, at the end of the day, you have to set out a course, you have to have productivity and profits as your, as your goal, and hence, uh, I think you'll disappear as a company very quickly. I still like to see, uh, when I walk to one of the many airports and you look at the business, uh, the business uh, book stand for something to, to read on the plane, I still haven't seen, seen a book saying how to run your, your company like the parliament, right? And I still think there's a big market for it, and it's, it's two different dynamics, right? So, uh, not absolutely sure I understood the question. I, I think that you simply have to run a, a business uh, according to, to certain dynamics in order for it to be successful. And whenever people interfere, that's when it gets really bad, when people start interfering into bonus payments or, or relative levels of pay, etc. because then you're starting to mess with, with what keeps this whole system afloat, right? Because you, you can allow, capitalism is fundamentally a very, very strong thing. Uh, individual human ingenuity is, is, is very, very strong. And, and you, can, you can carry a lot of idiocy on your back. I mean, this, we are talking about Atlas Shrugged here, basically, right? Uh, but if you start to mess up inside Atlas, inside the businesses that carry the world, then you'll have a real problem. Because if we can't run our own businesses anymore, how can we, how can we possibly... Uh, how can we possibly create a base for the society as a whole? I mean, it's not politicians creating the base for society. It is, it is businesses and, 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 and working individuals, right? Okay, uh, you've had your share. Uh, three from this side, uh, David, and then there's two at the back there. Rich, go to you to this. Thank you. David Brown, retired IT consultant. Uh, given the, the writings of the founders of the it was apparent that the collectivist model was prominent from the start in their thinking. With that in mind, do you really think it's possible to simply reform it as a free trade area only, rather than <coughs> resolve the whole thing, starting again with something quite different? Can we take the two at the back of the Put your hands up so you don't know where you are. Hi, well, back off now. With your four rules, your site are you confident going forward of success in the major tools, the tour force? Can, can you repeat that? Right? We can quite hear it up here. Can you just slowly. I was specifically inquiring about the four rules behind your site team. Cycling. Given other dynamics in professional cycling. <laughs> are you confident of winning major tours going forward? <laughs> Perhaps you can tell us a bit more about that. Values, values are the number one spot. Uh, yes, just there. Uh. Thank you, Sam. David Trust, well, the CEO of the Scotch Whiskey Association, but more relevantly in this context. Former British Ambassador in Denmark, and uh, I very much enjoyed, uh, appreciate, perhaps, Mike, your denunciation of the, the Danish social model. I must say, the appeal of the Danish interesting to hear you uh, put that point of view. Um, my question is really the one you began with, which is about you know, how to make free markets and capitalism sort of moral as well as uh, successful. And I mean, it seems to me part of the problem is that the morality of free markets and capitalism is difficult. You know, I felt a bit like a sort of rather um, uncomfortable sinner listening to a sternly Protestant lay preacher when I was listening to you go through your, your values. And isn't part of the problem that the values of free market capitalism are difficult to observe. They do involve honesty, integrity, productivity, and so on, whereas the values of the other side of the argument are a bit easier, more appealing, and it's always going to be very difficult to hard sell in that context. Okay. Um, well, let's start with, with the EU question again. Do I really believe in it? Uh, to be brutally honest, I probably don't, but I think you. <laughs> uh, there are many things I, I don't believe is going to happen, but I still get up every morning to, to try to fight for, for them happening anyway. But, but I, I, I think there's something fundamentally wrong with, with, with the structure in the EU, and I agree that it's very much in the DNA. Uh, there's a lot of political capital already invested in, in these huge mistakes, but it will eventually have to break. So, so uh, the euro will, in my view, not be in existence in 10 years in its current form. That, that's not possible. So it will break up. Uh, the question is whether, whether it will happen in, a, in an organized and rational way, trying to move, move things in the right direction, or, or it'll have to be a very dramatic exercise. And, 
knowing, uh, knowing politicians, it, it's very likely to be the latter. So no, my optimism is very low, but, uh, but I still think, you know, the more people that, uh, that get up and, and try to spread a good message and spread a value-based message, uh, the more likely it is that it could change. I'll tell you one small snippet I discussed with, with somebody out in, in, the, in the bar before. Um, in Denmark, a country of 5.6 million, as you now know, we, we, we have a think tank there called uh, CEPUS, uh, Center for Economic and Policy Studies. Um, and they made a count, actually trying to sell us something, but they made a count of how many people, counting politicians, commentators, uh, uh, individuals that write a, a letter to a newspaper, etc., et how many people actually makes a political statement during one given year in, in, uh, in the public space. Now, in a, in a nation of 5.6 million people, what would you think the number was? How many people state anything publicly? Sorry, how many people? Write a letter or a politician or sp speaking about politics is yeah. visible to the public. Oh, I get it. Tens of thousands? No. <laughs> Anybody else want to bet? In Denmark, 5.6 million people? Sorry? Tens of thousands. It's closer, but it's not correct. No, no, now you're on the shoot. 3,000. But to me, that was very surprising. Everybody that says anything about politics uh, and society is like three to 4,000 people, right? So, so uh, actually, what they were trying to sell me was something called CEPUS University, where we have systematically taken 50 smart young kids uh, and, and taught them about the liberal ideas and taught them how to write uh, new uh, letters uh, to, to the editor and stuff like that. And that's been running now for seven or eight years, and, and so we've had hundreds through that, through that particular uh, education. And I thought that was quite thought-provoking, that actually these, these guys, I think, uh, begin to make a difference. You can see them in the, in, the public, uh, in the public sort of arena now more and more, because there's so relatively few people actually trying to, to impact uh, the, the, way, the direction of society. So I think there is hope, but of course there's only hope if some a lot of people stand up, if everybody here in this room remembers to stand up and, and make their voice be heard, because if not, uh, you know, then, then there's no chance, that's for sure. But I am pretty skeptical about the, the EU. Uh, sorry, then we had the cycling. Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, <coughs> I do believe uh, that you adhere to, to the suspicion sometimes in cycling that, that people use more than values to achieve success, is that correct? <laughs> Is that correctly understood? I think that problem was much, much, much bigger 10 years ago, and I think we have actually been through a, a very significant change where 15 years ago, say, it was impossible to win something without uh, having an additional value or two. Uh, today, I think, actually, you have to be an idiot to, to not just stick to the values. And uh, I would say in the sixth or seventh season that we're going into with our own team, we won the Tour de France twice. We, uh, we won multiple other great races, uh, and we have a great team. And we have never had a, had a, a doping case in, in, in our case. And uh, I believe that problem is getting much, much smaller. And, and to be honest, I would not be surprised if it was significantly bigger in, in many other sports. I mean, what at least we have done in cycling is that we check and check and check and check people relentlessly. Uh, and I guess that's, that's pretty much what you can do. And then there are pretty draconian consequences for for using more than the four values. So yes, I certainly believe that you can win a great race today without, without uh, medical help. I'm absolutely convinced of that, in fact, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's what's been happening in, in the last few years. But going further back, there's no doubt that it was a much, much bigger problem. And the last one was... Um, capitalism? Capitalism, yeah. Did you do anything about it? Sorry, uh, I, you just got to remind me. Sorry, what was the question again? Um, Values what? The values are oh, the values of capitalism, of course, yeah. The, what I've been speaking about all day, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe that there's a value set, and I think actually that is, that is exactly why Ayn Rand is, is so important, because as you're saying, with the, with, the, with the pressure of the media and the public opinion and, and, and all the, 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 the constant stream of negativity you hear from, from, uh, from, from all sorts of places, uh, I actually believe that, that capitalism is, is much more value-based than it gets credit for. I personally know a lot of people that get up to, to work uh, every morning and, and, and certainly deploy much better value than the majority of the politicians that I know. So, so of course, again, everything relative to the benchmark, right? But, uh, 
I think there is a deep value in grain in doing good business. But of course, uh, as we haven't had truly free capitalism and as the state makes itself more and more important in markets, you know, it, it, will, uh, it will encourage weak souls and in some cases it will absolutely force people to accept playing on its terms rather than on, on free capitalistic terms. But I do think that the best answer to that particular question is actually in the in the books that, that are sitting behind us there. And uh, to be honest, I think the vast majority of, of business people that I know, uh, they, they are pretty decent people that get up with the best of intentions and, uh, and the world would be in a really, really, really bad place if we didn't have them. So, so at the end of the day, I do believe that the majority of, of, of business people actually uh, are, are pretty, pretty value-based, uh, has pretty good governance and, and uh, very, very careful not to, to commit mistakes. But of course there are lots of exceptions, but the more, if you want to look for the exceptions, look for the industries where the state is, is deeply involved. That, that's where the problems occur. Seems a good note uh, to end on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please do join us for a drink.